Guess who's back after an extended vacation? We'll tell you this week on Motory 2006. TSN's Motoring 2006 is brought to you by the new Q from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses. You know, when I was going to high school back in the mid-60s, my favorite teacher taught industrial arts. Now, he may not have been the best teacher in the world, but you know what? He owned a Chevy Impala. I think it was about a 1963. And now you know what they say, cool car cool teacher. Now I never got to own one but I've always had a soft spot for the Impala. But you know when General Motors got more involved in building trucks than cars the Impala kind of lost its way. But back in 1999 at the Detroit Auto Show GM unveiled the new generation Impala. But when it was unveiled alongside its predecessors well let's just say the response was underwhelming. I mean, I was shocked. It was a boring looking car. I couldn't figure out how they could sell them. And as far as I was concerned, the Impala nameplate was doomed. But heck, what do I know? They can't build enough of them, and they predict they'll sell over 300,000 Impalas this year in North America. Well, this week we're in the beautiful province of Saskatchewan celebrating its 100th anniversary in Confederation. And this is a spot that GM has selected to unveil the 2006 Chevy Impala. Every single part of the car, from the engine right down to the last nut and bolt, must be able to stand the gap. Yes, engineers call it reliability. And at Chevrolet, reliability is built into every car and truck. Well, the first thing I think of when I think of Impala isn't the plain sedan that they sold the majority of, it's the SS model. And to me that's just go fast, have fun, put a big grin on your face. Ladies and gentlemen, meet the new flagship, the new American icon for the next century, the Chevrolet Impala. <laughs> I remember it and I remember thinking when they brought it out, is this all? Like, where's the SS? Where's the real Impala? Because I enjoy a performance car and the new Impala seems to be taking us back in that direction. For 2006 it is all new. It's an all new Impala. It gives you all new exterior look. A uh, brand new sheet metal. It gives you a brand new interior. Uh, upscale, more comfortable, more refined and more importantly all new powertrains across the board. We've got a new V8 with uh, 303 horsepower, it's the return of the small block V8 to Impala. So it's a big news in our SS model. People like old names on new cars. The other thing that GM has done is, is they've done their homework. The car is bigger inside, it's more comfortable. In theory, you can have six people in it, although I think the majority will be ordered with the five seat bucket seats up front. And the Impala SS is back. I can't emphasize that too much. You've got to have the show car to bring you along through the pipeline for all the average cars. When you have an SS, when you have a V8 powered Impala, you get some bragging rights. Um, for power and price, because it comes in at a significant price advantage over a V8 powered a Chrysler 300. Um, but you still got a front wheel drive car with gobs of horsepower, which means that ultimately the traction control system is going to kick in and control it. So it's more like a, a statistical advantage rather than a real performance advantage. Well, basically, with the new car, the 06 Impala, we're taking comfort and performance to the next level. So that new family of powertrains are going to give us more power across the board. Uh, in terms of comfort, we've got a much refined interior. We've got uh, new innovation with flip and fold flat rear seats to give you great cargo carrying capacity. So we're just basically taking all the strengths of Impala and dialing, dialing them up a notch or two for 06. Overall, the, the look of the new car is very clean and crisp and contemporary. Uh, we've changed the rear uh, design of the deck lid, so the tail lamp treatment is different. We've cleaned it up, uh, sharpened it up for 06. I think it's a car that's going to appeal to a lot of folks. Uh, it's got a very contemporary look. For 2006, we've got displacement on demand technology in our 5.3 liter V8. And basically what that does for you is gives you lots of power 
in normal driving conditions it's V8, it's 303 horsepower. But uh, when you're out in the highway driving around certain light load conditions it deactivates half the cylinders to give you some great fuel economy savings. It actually saves you about 8% in terms of fuel economy in those situations. I think the Impala succeeds because it's priced right. I mean, you know, the, the North American market, Canada and the United States, is still very price sensitive. And the vehicle is extremely affordable. Um, it's got decent reliability numbers. And therefore, it doesn't need to be spectacular. I mean, keep in mind the best-selling cars in North America, a Toyota Camry and a Honda Accord, neither of which anyone would argue is a styling masterpiece. If there's any problem that the Impala would have in the marketplace right now, um, it would be uh, styling issues need to be improved continue to be improved even with the 06 changes. But the other thing is residual values. What this thing is worth when it drives off the dealer lot. Camry and Accord have excellent residual values. Impala, um, like a lot of GM products because they put so many incentives on them, have weak resale values and that's a real issue if you're going to plan to hold on to the car for less than five years. Well, Impala has always been a big seller for us at Chevrolet, and, and certainly look at the U.S. market, it's a huge seller in the midsize segment, and Canada, it's been really popular as well. We sold uh, 13,000 units here in Canada in our top year a couple years back in 03, and uh, it, you know, it's a powerhouse in the midsize segment. Clearly, if you sit in the cockpit and you look around, the panel wraps, the, the fit and the finish, a lot better. The quality of the materials, the surfacing, the, the touch and feel of it, a lot better. I would argue that they could go much, much farther with the exterior style and they can make this car look a lot more exciting for not a bigger investment. I mean, you know, there's a saying around the design business, it costs exactly the same amount of money to build an ugly car as it does to build a beautiful one. What costs a quarter of a million dollars and helps to save fuel? <laughs> not this. More later on Kenzie's Corner. Whenever your product portfolio holds one of the best-selling cars in Canada, every time you redesign that car, you take an enormous risk. This week on Test Drive, we take a look at the risk Honda took when they redesigned this all-new Civic. As before, the Civic is offered in a variety of different models. Everything from the sedan tested here to a more powerful hybrid and a couple of coupes that use their own platform. The base and high performance SI model. The one thing all have in common is a bigger body that's 35% stiffer than the outgoing car. Honda also rethought the safety angle and added much more of it. Anti-lock brakes, side airbags and drop down side curtains are all now standard items. It's also an appreciably larger car. In the case of the sedan, this means a wheelbase that grows by a substantial 80 millimeters. You know, the single biggest change to this new Civic is right here in front of the driver. Gone is the conventional dash in favor of a two-tier setup. The upper half, which is above the steering wheel rim, puts everything in your peripheral vision. You'll find temperature, fuel, and speed readouts up there. Below the steering wheel rim, you'll find the tack and all the warning lights. Now, at first blush, it looks plain weird. However, you get used to it, and it really does function very well. The only thing I don't care for the digital readout from the Speedo. I really don't need to know when I've gone from 12 to 13 kilometers an hour in stop and go traffic. If you can live with that, this thing really does work very well. As for the handling, the Civic takes a big step forward as the strut based front suspension and double wishbones at the rear bring a setup that's as neutral as any front wheel drive car I've driven. Through the pylons, this meant a flatter attitude, less body roll, and a much quicker response to steering input. It really has been done very nicely. Even the anti-lock brakes are improved. In the past, Honda's system tended to intervene way too early. The tester's system stayed out of the picture until it was actually needed, which is exactly as it should be. You know, the rest of the interior of this Civic has been very well thought through as well. If you're a kleptomaniac, well, this place is paradise. You've got a massive box, cup holders, spot for your cell phone, more room for more stuff, yet more room for yet more stuff, a glove box, door pockets, it's just got storage space everywhere. The other thing to like, one hand covers just about all of the radio and climate controls, and you also get tilt and telescopic steering. 
Add that to the height adjustable driver's seat and this car will accommodate just about anyone of any size. When it comes to power, the new sedan employs a larger 1.8 litre engine that features the latest version of Honda's iVTEC variable valve timing. The result is a rewarding 140 horsepower and 128 pound-feet of torque. As with all of Honda's engines, this one loves to be revved and seems to thrive on being pushed, which is just as it should be when an open road beckons. The new engine can be married to a 5-speed manual, which I do recommend, or a new 5-speed automatic. The really good news is that as well as bringing much more enthusiasm to the drive, this new engine also delivers better fuel economy and fewer emissions. The other big improvement to this new Civic is the amount of room in the back seat. There's plenty of tow room, knee room and a ton of headroom. Indeed, the back seat environment of this Civic is almost as roomy as an Accord of just a couple of years ago. It really does show how the entry level car is changing. The other thing, if you're the poor sucker that gets stuck sitting in the middle, there is some good news. Because there's no tunnel, you've got somewhere to put your feet. All of this said, if you really want the real deal, you're going to have to pony up the bucks for the SI. It not only gets a firmer suspension, which means even better handling, it also earns a larger 2-litre engine that fires 197 horsepower and 139 pound-feet of torque to the tarmac through a flick of the wrist gearbox and a limited slip differential. It really is a delightful combination that puts some serious shine back on the SI's once tarnished Apple. From just about every perspective, this new Civic is a better car. Better room, better power, better handling, and a better overall package, primarily because it's a much safer vehicle. The bottom line, this car sets a very high standard in the entry-level car category. The CSX is actually an entirely new vehicle for Acura Canada. It is exclusive to the Canadian market um, and it was designed to be Acura's new gateway. So uh, the kind of car we were looking for was something that lived up to the Acura name and to the Acura levels and expectations of performance. The engine is a, a 2.0 liter uh, iVTEC. It's uh, derived directly from the RSX. It puts out 155 horsepower and 139 pounds feet of torque. Um, it, you can mate it with either a 5-speed automatic transmission, which also comes with standard uh, paddle shifts, which uh, definitely uh, ups the sport factor, uh, or you can equip it with a 5-speed uh, manual transmission, which is of course um, uh, also quite sporty. CSX is, uh, is a nice execution of a Honda Civic that's been upgraded to appeal to you know somebody with a little bit more money and who wants uh, the opportunity to buy a brand. I mean, you're really buying a brand, not necessarily a product. We've also looked at the rest of the lineup for uh, design and feature inspiration. So you'll see very, um, very family-oriented uh, design cues from Acura, uh, including the uh, five-sided uh, grille, um, the aggressive headlights, and the uh, circular graphic in the rear lights as well. So overall, uh, very much an Acura through and through. Interesting. I think it's a Civic, which we're told not to compare it to, but it is. It's got. Uh, a little more stuff, it's a little bit better quality here and there and uh, you know with a navi system which is something Civic doesn't have so there's a slight change in the dash. I hate the dashboard, I hate the two-tiered dashboard. I think it's a deal breaker for at least somebody, it would be a deal breaker for me. I think it's a contrivance that is really unnecessary and it's not very it's not very efficient. What's more having a uh, you know a dashboard big enough that if you could throw several pizzas up there just is not a 
it's not a good use of space. I understand why they did it. It's mostly about safety and some packaging, but you know, it's, it's just not for me. I think this fits with what they've done with the, with the other models. Like EL kind of didn't fit anymore. I think um, it probably did what they wanted to do is bring some people in at, a, at an entry level, if you like, if there is an entry level. And um, that CSX will probably build on that. I don't know if they'll lose that many. The kind of person that uh, we expect to uh, be attracted to this car is the kind of person we expect to be attracted to our other vehicles. They just happen to be younger and uh, have uh, a slightly lower income. So uh, this is the kind of person we want to come into the Acura family and stay for the long run. Uh, they'll come in and look at the uh, RSX, or they'll choose the CSX because it's a sedan, and uh, they will look towards the TSX and the TL as their next purchase. As we said earlier, the big news in the brand new Impala is, of course, the return of the V8 SS. But also in this midsize section, the Impala has an exclusive feature, and that's in the back seat. Both back seats will flip forward, giving you a convenient grocery bag hooks and also some storage space on the bottom. And the seat backs also fold down to create a generous pass-through from the trunk when seat backs are folded flat. I can hear our man in the Quaker State Garage, Bill Gardner, saying, I got all that storage space in my pickup truck, but you know, you got to think Bill must have a soft spot in his heart somewhere for the Impala. How about it, Bill? Absolutely, Brad, for sure. You know, the old Impala, when it was rear-wheel drive for many generations, uh, probably a, as close as you could get to an indestructible car, and I don't think there was an Achilles heel to that old car. Uh, they were pretty much bulletproof. They would just soldier on forever in spite of anything that you neglected or anything you did or didn't do to that vehicle they just kept going and going now eventually they had to redesign that car and come out with a front wheel drive version they built them rear wheel drive up until the early 90s then there were a few model years with with uh, no impala then we came out with the front wheel drive impala now we're into the second generation of front wheel drive impala now they've introduced a v8 option as well but it's interesting every time uh, you redesign a car, those Achilles heels change or move. You know, the weak link in the chain may be somewhere different than it was before. And I've got an interesting part here on the tailgate of the truck, and that's the front CV shaft from a typical front-wheel drive vehicle like the current Impala. Now, on front-wheel drive vehicles in their er first generation of almost everybody's front-drive vehicle, the weak link in the chain was always this outer CV joint. Usually the boot would fracture and fail. It would throw the lubricant that's inside this boot out into the inner wheelhouse area, and that outer joint would start clicking and clacking when you went around sharp corners and applied the throttle. You'd get a click, 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 click sound, and you'd know that your outer joint had failed. You'd have to replace either the outer joint or the whole shaft, depending on how you went about it. Now, you could also have problems with the inner joint with high mileage. They wear out, boot can fail as well, and you usually get vibrations at high speed or a shudder when you're accelerating at 80 or 90 kilometers. But in any case, these were usually where the Achilles heel of this CV shaft was. Interesting thing, in the past year, I've had three vehicles towed in where the weak link in the shaft was the shaft itself in the middle. They actually broke right in the middle, and the outer CV joint and the inner CV joint and their boots, respective boots, were in perfect condition. So it just goes to show you that when they, when they added a component, which happened to be this vibration damper in the middle of the shaft, the Achilles heel changed from out here to in here. We're still changing the whole sub-assembly to get rid of that problem, but it just shows you that sometimes these problems can shift around and change in nature, and how you go about fixing them and the cost of fixing them can change dramatically. And you know what? No matter how they redesign cars, there's always one weak link in the chain, and that's why it's a great thing to be an auto mechanic these days. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2006. <laughs> The RM Classic Car Auction uh, features sports cars, muscle cars, hot rods, classic cars, all the way back to 1911, I believe is the oldest car we have here. We try to focus on the, the collectability of the car, uh, the, the rarity or the desirability and what the market's looking for right now. That's what we try to bring here to Toronto. I appreciate fine cars and I look at cars as art. So I'm coming down very much as a voyeur. However, I have a wife and daughter and quite often they bait me into buying things. So from time to time I come home from these auctions with new vehicles. And that's not so bad.
Well, check that out. This is a Mercedes-Benz CL65 AMG, 6-liter V12 engine, twin turbochargers when one just isn't enough. 604 horsepower, 738 foot-pounds of torque, and the fuel consumption, well, you don't really want to know that. This isn't exactly the poster child for the environmental century. Now, I could try and justify this car, saying that luxury cars like this develop technologies like high-intensity discharge headlights or ABS brakes or airbags, which eventually trickle down into everyday cars. I could try and justify it, but I'm not gonna. This car costs a quarter of a million dollars. It's there for one reason and one reason only, to prove to your friends that you got more money than they've got. I mean, you can't even begin to drive this car the way it's meant to be driven on our roads. But you know what? We all have our ways of wasting fuel. These golfer guys out there communing with nature, how do they get to the golf courses? Probably in some great whacking SUV. And those triathlon guys out there running and biking and swimming and being all healthy? Well, they hold those events in Hawaii. How do they get to Hawaii? They don't swim to Hawaii. They fly in a flipping airplane. And those planes will use more fuel in one day than this car will in its entire life. So, hey, the car business is about emotion. This is the way we get our emotion. This is the way we choose to waste our fuel. Maybe it's wrong, but I'll tell you how I can justify this car. Listen to this. I'm Jim Cassidy. You know, the new 2006 Chevy Impala is a big step up from its predecessor. And of course, the highlight is the return of the SS with the 300 horsepower small block V8. If I have any criticism, I just wish they'd be more aggressive when it comes to the exterior styling. Before we go, as we stand here in front of the Saskatchewan Legislature in Regina, it reminds me of a little trivia. Did you know this province has more roads than any other province or territory in the country? Just over 187,000 kilometers. Now, there is a catch. Only 15% of the roads are paved. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. The vehicle really impresses its, uh, with its build quality. Uh, we've only had a short time to drive it, but you look over it and, uh, and uh, it's a very well put together, uh, very well put together piece. TSN's Motoring 2006 has been brought to you by the new Q from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses.